Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Here we are at the beginning of this new year of 2023. And we are also at the beginning of the course on fundamental principles in Catholic bioethics within the Masters of Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Beginning always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, send forth your spirit, and we shall be created. You shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, uh, before going into the lecture, any questions or comments from anything prior? All right. Now, Normally, this is the first course in the program, just to keep some kind of sequence, even though each course can also be taught as a standalone, as it were. There is some building on principles, but uh, most of you already had the environmental bioethics course this past fall, uh, simply because I had to put uh, two cohorts together due to my uh, limitation on the number of uh, credits, credit load that I could have. Um, so part of the uh, what I'm going to be saying today is a little redundant. And that's on one side. And the other side is also because uh, it happens at this cohort. Uh, most of you have already a scientific background or background in biology. Uh, Four of you actually graduated from here, from St. Thomas University with your bachelor's, either biology or natural science. So you have a background. And Elizabeth, who is joining the cohort now for the spring, you also have a scientific background by way of your uh, work, uh, working with uh, DNA and um, genetic fingerprinting and so forth. So it's not every cohort that has that. Some, uh, if you recall from uh, the course in environmental bioethics. We had a number of students there from the previous cohort who were uh, uh, priests or uh, lay people who did not have a scientific background necessarily. That's why we say that bioethics is interdisciplinary and it picks up both on the science and on the philosophy or theology for doing ethics. And that's why I try to give as much background as possible to pick up uh, everyone uh, who has more or less background, either on the scientific side or on the philosophical slash theological side. All right, so with regards to the introduction, I think you already know uh, my background, both in uh, science and in theology. Uh, but the reason why I show this uh, slide is because it's always important to speak with competence uh, in these issues of bioethics. I say everybody has an opinion and we have to respect every opinion, even if the opinion is totally ludicrous, out of context or out of touch with reality, because we respect uh, people, we respect our opinion. But not every opinion is correct necessarily, especially when we talk about uh, complicated issues like in bioethics, either human life bioethics or environmental bioethics. And therefore, when we talk about these issues, competency, right, the background uh, that the person has uh, is very relevant, is very important. And that's precisely one of my motivations for launching this uh, master's program uh, now seven, seven years ago, because you're the seventh cohort. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that every year I've had uh, some students in it. It varies between five and 10. So it's always a small group, but uh, even through COVID, it never shut down. <laughs> and I'm very happy for that. Okay, so that's uh, the background, both uh, a doctorate in moral theology and a doctorate in genetics. So those are the two, uh, like we say, terminal degrees uh, for the competence in this field. I'm not gonna belabor on that. I'm gonna move forward. I do want to mention that the textbook for this semester is this one here on what evolution is, what evolution is, is the title of the book. 
and by Ernst Meyer. I'll be talking about him a little bit more, especially in the second half of the, of the lecture today. And basically what I do with the textbook is I lend it to you uh, for free, all right? Uh, because this edition is already out of print. And so I buy them used online. Whenever I find them between five to $10, I buy them used and then I have a stack of them. So I'll lend you this uh, throughout the semester. We will not cover the whole text, but uh, main chapters that are mostly relevant to us. I didn't show there's a handout there for you. Okay. And then you have two options at the end of the semester of this course. You can either give it back to me to be used for the next cohort, or you can give me between five and $10 so I can buy a new one online, all right, or a, a used one and replenish the stock. Okay, that's with regards to the textbook in brief. I'll cover it in more detail, like I said, in the second half of the lecture. Let's get right into it. And again, to remind you that as far as I'm concerned, the only wrong question in the whole program for me is the one that is not asked, all right? The wrong question is the one that's not asked, meaning that whenever you have a question or a comment to make, just jump right in. We're a small group, you know, so it's not that it's going to uh, uh, throw us uh, off course. Uh, and that's an advantage when we have a small number of students is that essentially each one of you has more time proportionally to ask questions, make comments, and all that. So I, I want the, every course to be uh, dialectic. Okay. Um, yes. Nothing on the canvas yet. Yes. So, it's not coming up either. I'm, I'm able to connect. I have everything working. Yeah. I don't, when I went to canvas, it doesn't, um, the, the module is not showing up. It's, so for you, it's not populated. Right. Okay, Elizabeth, let's do this. Um, since I'm starting already, um, the handout will help you because the handout is essentially yeah. the same as the PowerPoint for today. All right. So you cover there. Yes. In, at the break, we can take a look because it seems to be a particular issue with your account itself, with your account. So maybe because you're coming in new to the cohort. Uh, we've had that before, all right? So you rely mostly on, on the, the physical handout that I gave, at least for the first half of the lecture. All right, uh, going forward then, keeping in mind that in principle, this is, uh, or theoretically, this is the first course that I teach normally on the cohort, even though you already had, well, four of you have already had the environmental course. So uh, there's been an introduction to the topic from that perspective, but with all of you, we still need to cover the other aspect of bioethics uh, today, which is human life. And while I say that, let me stay on uh, bioethics for a moment. Bioethics as such, it today has two main pillars or two main areas of study, all right? Uh, which is fairly intuitive when you think about uh, what's a functional definition of bioethics, just to get us thinking back into um, what we're talking about, the, the overarching topic, bioethics. You can see it's a compound word, right? It's got biology. In other words, it's got nature, science in it, and it also has ethics, which is one of the branches of philosophy. And in principle, these two areas have nothing to do with each other. Biology is the empirical, quantitative, and qualitative study of nature, the, the organic biological nature that surrounds us. And ethics is um, <clears throat> about human behavior, what should be done, what should not be done, right? What is correct, what is incorrect with regards to human behavior. So when we just look at those two fields of study or two aspects of, of human endeavor, we don't see a direct connection until we throw into the mix technology, right? Because technology today allows us to do things that was just science fiction a few years ago, all right? And we know that our contemporary society is heavily technological, uh, beginning with this little creature that we call a cell phone, which is really a microcomputer in our pocket. 
and the internet, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I certainly don't need to convince anyone of uh, the high degree of technology that we have in our daily lives today. And so when we have technology and then it allows us to do things that were even unthinkable uh, just uh, years ago, right? Like for example, uh, one of the topics we'll cover in the beginning of human life is designer babies, how to manufacture babies and, and, and tinker with their DNA so that we get certain characteristics to express and others not to express. Uh, that was either science fiction or just unthinkable a few years ago, and today it can actually be done. It can be done. So just to review some of the stuff that I said at the beginning of last semester, a functional definition for bioethics is what can be done out of what, what may be done out of what can be done in science and technology today. So I'm focusing into the distinction between can and may, all right? Now I'm taking you into thinking past, uh, and I know it's uh, early, early on a Saturday morning, but we need to get those neurons uh, activated. And when we think about can and may, it's not just a grammatical distinction, right? We can do many things technologically, but the big question in ethics, of course, is may we do them? In other words, should we do them or not? And that's where the human intellect and the human will comes in to play, to realize ultimately that there are certain things that we can do that we should not do. Again, uh, in anticipation of the beginning of life bioethics course, for example, uh, human animal chimeras, mixing DNA between a human and an animal and getting a hybrid, it's called a chimera, which is, uh, from the Greek mythology several hundred years before the time of Christ, uh, you know, a, um, uh, an ox with the head of a lion or something like that, right? That's a chimera mixing two species that don't occur in nature at all. So human animal chimeras, for example, half human and half pig, you think it's totally insane, right? Well, it's been tried actually. <laughs> because it can be done in the lab, it can be done, but should we do it? You know, and we're gonna to have to appeal also to our intuitions, our basic, most basic fundamental intuitions of what is right and wrong here with regards to human life, all right? That's coming up, that's for the, the summer course. Back to this, so I came out with CHI. Yeah, let me bring up a more document here. See if I can do this. Give me one moment to get organized. I'm trying to pull up just a Word document where I can write some words. Uh, here's a Word document. Let's see. doesn't allow me, it's asking me to, uh, to do some loops here. Give me a minute, uh, let me try this. Not responding. Talk about technology, technical difficulties, right? Every semester, uh, information technology, the IT department of the university resets all of the computers on campus, all the public computers like this one. And so it wipes out all the uh, personal information and so forth. So every semester we have to reapply for a license, for example, to use microphones. What I'm trying to say, bottom line is that I cannot, um, open just a Word document where I can write and you would see it on the screen. Uh, again, I'll try to work that out uh, during the break. So for now, we'll just have to re rely on good old spelling, grammar spelling, <laughs> C-H-I-M-A-M chimera, M-E-R-A chimera, all right? Okay. 
Uh, okay, so we have this interdisciplinary field that is very broad based and it needs again reinforcing the competence both in the sciences and in uh, ethics or um, reasonable thinking. Now, we're going to look at origins. Origins is a big part of uh, responding to the bioethical issues of the day. For example, again, it's not by coincidence that things match so well with what is happening in American history right now and in world history just by the chronology. So we're at the beginning of this new year of 2023, right? And in fact, it's actually uh, the 21st of uh, January. Now, if we go back 50 years <laughs> to uh, 1973, January, I think it was January 23rd. Uh, anyone know what happened with the Supreme Court? Uh, January 23rd of uh, 50 years ago. Some of you were not around, where you were only in the mind of God, <laughs> but I was around. <laughs> I was, in fact, I was uh, sitting at the desk like, like you, uh, studying biology at FIU. I was just graduating from biology at FIU uh, 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, what happened was the famous or infamous uh, decision of the Supreme Court of Roe versus Wade. Oh, I just thought of how I can fool the system. Excuse me. <laughs> if I open an email, I should have access to text, to texting, right? There it is. So that's my board. <laughs> Make it bigger. There we go. Here's my whiteboard. Improvise. What's the saying? If there's a will, there is certainly a way. Here's my whiteboard. Ha! It's an email. Is that large enough or maybe larger? All right. So anyone know this decision of Roe v. Wade? What? Exactly. The supposed right to have an abortion legally in the Constitution of the United States. That happened 50 years ago. Uh, Mary of 1973. And so this March for Life started back then in, in Washington, DC. And yesterday, Friday was the March for Life 50 years ago, uh, <clears throat> celebrating a new decision that came out in the summer of uh, 2022 the Dobbs decision. That essentially said no right to abortion, at least on the US Constitution. So it goes back to the states. Doesn't mean that that Dobbs decision <coughs> me, forbids abortions. It just says that there is no such right in the US Constitution. So for 50 years, we were acting on an assumption that was wrong. But in the meantime, this wrong decision of 50 years ago, Roe versus Wade, costed 60 million lives in the United States. So about 60 million uh, children were aborted in this 50, in this 50 years, All right? So it makes a big difference, it makes a huge difference. But uh, the Supreme Court with its uh, new court uh, looked at the constitution very carefully and said, there is no right to an abortion. In other words, the unborn is simply not mentioned in the US constitution, it's just not mentioned. Okay. All right, so that's an example uh, how providence works because here we are in 
January of 2023, and the uh, what is known as the March for Life in Washington, D.C., which is the first one that is post Roe v. Wade. So it's a huge celebration, estimated to be about 100,000 people that went to March uh, for Life in uh, Washington, D.C. I've been to that march before several times with uh, it's mostly full of young people. And uh, these are the young pro-lifers of the United States. And there are hundreds of thousands. I was looking at news in the BBC. Uh, normally, I look at the BBC online, just the headlines early in the morning. And if there's an article that uh, catches my attention, then I go in and read the actual article. Otherwise, just the headlines, because it's very difficult. I find it very difficult to get international news here in the United States, <laughs> okay? Uh, so that's what I do. And it has the article right there. You can look it up. Estimated uh, about 100,000 people. So at this point, it has already been declared the largest um, march in the world that has been going on for 50 years. <laughs> of a record of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that go uh, to stand up for the right to life, for the natural right, because uh, we just simply don't have the right to take away uh, people's lives, innocent lives. So anyway, uh, I'm saying it's providential because here we are beginning this uh, course, and that's certainly a very hot topic. It's, it's a contemporary issue, right? And the basis of this topic of uh, uh, abortion or no abortion has to do with human life begins. That's a big question. When does human life begin? So I'm pointing this out simply because of the issue of origins, all right? The, the issue of origins. Now we have two types of origins. This course is setting us up mostly for the next two courses that will be beginning of life issues and end of life issues on human life. And in fact, the third course on this line, what I'm thinking about it, is actually healthcare bioethics, which is what the other court is doing now. The, uh, the folks uh, who were with you last semester, okay? They're ending this semester, so they're doing that last course on healthcare bioethics. And obviously it's human healthcare, right? So we can see the beginning of human life, the end of human life, and what's in between the middle of human life is when we get sick or not sick, right? So that healthcare. So with those three courses, beginning of life, healthcare, and end of life, we cover the full span of uh, human life bioethically, bioethically speaking. All right. So we'll devote a whole course looking at the origin of the individual. And that's what ontogenetically means, all right? Again, uh, there are many words that we use in bioethics and in science in general and philosophy and theology that are compound words. Compound words, they have uh, <clears throat> typically, it's like the noun and the adjective together that comes from Latin way back. And German is also that way where you have the noun and the, and the adjective together. So the noun is a substance, right? In fact, grammatically, the noun is also called a substantive. Mm -hmm. The substantive is what tells us what the thing is. It answers the question, the what, what is it? Right? So is it a giraffe? Is it a pine tree? Is it a cloud? Is it a building? That's the noun. Mm -hmm. Is it a human life? And then the adjective is what qualifies the noun. Is it an old person? Is it an unborn? Is it an old tree? Is it a, what kind of tree? What kind of cloud, right? That qualifies. But the substance is the noun itself. Mm -hmm. and that's why these words are compound that way. So we're gonna be looking at uh, human life in the next, uh, in this course and the next one, phylogenetically and ontogenetically. These are just fancy words and let's break them down a little bit. Genetically, it talks about uh, origin, Genesis, for example, the book of Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Genetics is the inheritance that uh, we get from our parents from one generation to the other. So the word genetics is a reference to origins right? Then the other part of the word that we need to decipher is either the phylo or the onto, right? Now, let's look at onto first. 
and then we'll leave it that to rest for, for next semester. Onto is being, all right? Ontology is a study of being, is a philosophical category. Things, precisely the nouns, right? So the study of human beings is um, ontology. And so ontogenetics is essentially the origin of humans at the individual basis. When did we begin to, to be a human person, all right, a human being? So the, the individual origin of uh, human beings, that's ontogenetics. And we'll have a whole course on that at the beginning of human life, like I said, uh, next semester. Phylogenetics, all right, or phylogeny, phylo is a reference to the group like phylum precisely is one of the categories in the scientific classification that we'll go over today. Uh, phylogenetics or phylogeny is the group, the whole phylum, which again, it's a Greek word for group, large group, right? The group is all humans. In other words, the origin of the human species as such, when did our species become human, all right? In other words, the biological Adam and Eve, <laughs> which is actually even a biological reference. You may have heard of uh, someone called mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. We'll talk about them toward the end of this semester. All right. But those are biological categories of the first humans. The first humans, at least at the level of genus, homo. We know scientifically with a scientific classification, uh, our species is classified as Homo sapiens, right? Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens. It includes the genus and the species, but the genus itself is Homo, H-O-M-O. -O. Where's my board? <laughs> okay, now for correctness. There are some conventions, uh, since I'm writing it already. The genus is uh, written with a capital letter and the actual species name is written in lowercase. So that's the convention. And then you either, I don't know if I can do this, make it, uh, I'm not gonna worry about it, but you either put it in italics or you underline the scientific name. It's just a convention, all right? That's how it's done. When we talk about actual scientific names, it's either italicized, so it goes inclined, or uh, uh, underlined, the, the actual word. All right, details. So this particular course is going to be focusing on human life phylogenetically. In other words, we're going to try to trace the origins of the human species back in time with the fossil record and all this, which means that we need to get into evolution, all right? And we're looking at uh, actually uh, evolution and also we're going to address this uh, apparent contradiction between creation or evolution, right? Creation or evolution, we're gonna address that and see that they actually far from being contradictory to each other, they actually complement each other. And I'm going to provide evidence and hopefully convince you that they actually complement each other, the whole thing of evolution and creation from two different perspectives. One is a perspective of science, the other perspective is of theology. All right, so on this course, we're gonna be focusing mostly on the origin of the human species as a whole, not individual human beings like you and I. Also, we're going to highlight the intrinsic dignity of uh, human life that is not contingent. What do I mean by contingent? Exactly, dependent is a synonym, right? Synonym. So, uh, I can drive a car as long as I have a key to the car or I know how to drive, that's contingency, right? In dignity of the human person, of the human species is not contingent on any committee 
or a politician or um, our parents or medicine or society, you know, it's not subject. The dignity of humanity is not subject to be given by anyone because it's been given to us by God, by the creator, right? And that's what we talk about intrinsic dignity. Things don't have a dignity of their own. They're, they have a dignity insofar as they're useful. But human beings, we have a dignity of our own. And we're going to be appealing to that intuition. And so if uh, someone has an intrinsic dignity, then that person needs to be respected, right? Respected, regardless of what their beliefs are, their uh, level of intellect, their age, their social status, et cetera, et cetera. It's independent of any uh, factor, simply by the fact that they are human beings. Every human being needs to be respected, deserves to be respected, all right? And that makes it intrinsic, the intrinsic dignity. So these are basic principles that appeal to our intuitions. It comes to a point where the, the issue is so intuitive, is so basic and fundamental that any normal person will understand it and will agree, yes, every human being deserves to be respected. Now, the proof of the phylogenetic origins of our species, the proof is going to come from both science and faith. And that's how we integrate bioethics, right? It has a, it has a uh, scientific component or biological component, and it has a philosophical slash theological component. And so the proof will come from both science and faith. And from science, we're gonna be looking at evolution and genetics precisely, especially the past 200 years more or less uh, from the 1800s up until today. And faith, we're going to use the Bible or sacred scripture and tradition. Which, by the way, this is also a Judeo-Christian, uh, yeah, Judeo-Christian theological anthropology. In other words, when we talk about the Bible, it not only appeals to Christianity, but it also appeals to Judaism. And we can say that the religious roots, at least in the Western Hemisphere, the, the Western Hemisphere means our culture, right? The the religious and theological roots of our Western hemisphere are what we call Judeo-Christian. In contrast, for example, to Islam, or which comes from the Orient, or in contrast with Buddhism or Shintoism, uh, like in Japan, or ancestor worship that occurs in China, for example. Those are traditions that are very different from ours as far as religion and uh, spirituality is concerned. And in general, they tend to be dualistic. It's a very general statement, of make a more or less radical separation between material and spiritual. Whereas our Judeo-Christian tradition is rather unity, all right? There is, a, um, there is a substantial unity between body and soul, for example, all right? So we don't make that radical distinction as they do in Buddhism. And so in Buddhism, for example, it's an issue of abstracting oneself as much as possible from the material reality that surrounds us. So all this asceticism, all this meditation and contemplation that they do is to try to extract themselves from the physical reality that surrounds them because uh, it's considered kind of corrupt that it doesn't contribute anything to our spirituality. We take exception to that. Our vision is a unitarian vision of body and soul together. So we talk about an incarnate spirituality. And I have much more to say about that uh, kind of in the second part of the course. The first part of the course is going to be based mostly on the anthropological part. So a Judeo-Christian theological anthropology is a vision of the human person that includes the possibility that uh, of uh, that God has created us, okay, and that we are, as the Bible says, God's image, the image of God, which again is not unique to Christians. It's also uh, part of the Jewish tradition. So this is a big mouthful. 
in Judeo-Christian theological anthropology. Again, if you take it from the back forward, okay. Uh, anthropology is a study of anthropo, which is a reference to the human. It's a study of the human. What is our vision of the human person, the human being? Theological, which includes the possibility of God being in the mix as creator, as God, all right? And Judeo-Christian, which is the tradition that we're following, which is, like I mentioned, a unitary incarnate tradition, body and soul one. And these are our roots that go back, uh, well, about 5,000 years, actually, because uh, the Jewish people today are in the year 5,000 and something. In other words, about 3,000 years before the time of Christ, which is uh, more or less the origin of the Jewish people as such, as the covenant, the first covenant between God and a group of people in humanity. All right, we'll have more to say about that as we get into the, the second part of the semester. The first part is gonna be more on the scientific side. So this is kind of the two parts of the semester. The first one is gonna be on evolution and genetics. And the second one will look at how the Bible specifically, uh, the 73 books of the Bible and our uh, Judeo-Christian tradition dovetails and actually complements and um, validates the data that we get from evolution and genetics, which is an empirical data that we can measure. Obviously, Bible and tradition appeals to a different aspect of our reasoning, which is more intuitive. It's inductive rather than deductive, all right? Forward. I'm going to start about 200 years ago so that we don't have to go too, too far back to the very origin of science. And uh, just to say in passing, uh, the scientific method as such, as a rigorous method of studying the world that surrounds us, especially natural phenomena, including life, but also the planets and the solar system and, and, and the galaxies and so forth starts around 500 years ago in around the year 1500 in Europe with what is known as the Copernican revolution. The shift in vision that uh, uh, the earth and the other planets uh, that we can see more or less with the naked eye rotating around the sun as opposed to the earth being the center of the planetary system and the entire universe, right? There's a shift there. And that shift is significant because it has to do with real material objects, not just a, a, um, a thinking, a theological thinking. The reason why, the main reason why it was thought for centuries and millennia that the earth was the center of the universe simply because it is on the earth that incarnation happened. In other words, that God became a human being. That's the, the basic tenet of uh, Christianity, that God becomes a human being in the person of Jesus Christ, and he happened to be living here on planet Earth. And so theologically, that makes Earth the center of the universe. But it's a theological center. It's not an empirical center. It's not a planetary center, because we have ample evidence from astronomy today that for our planetary system, like we saw, remember we saw in environmental bioethics, the four inner planets, the four outer planets, and all the asteroid belts and so forth, that we are certainly rotating around uh, the, um, uh, the sun, all right? And so we mm, astronomically, right? The earth is not even the center of our planetary system let alone the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, where there are millions of, of solar systems. And not even, and even less and less and less, the center of the universe as such, where there are millions, maybe trillions of galaxies, <laughs> okay? Now, it could be, in fact, it, it, at the level of the universe, the physical universe that is out there, a combination of matter and energy and so forth, so, um, we cannot even talk about a center as such because the actual shape, if you will, of the universe is so convoluted, is this uh, geodesic inverted uh, plane uh, of a negative curvature 
that it doesn't even have a center as such. You know, doesn't apply. Okay. So backing out of the planetary system and the solar system and the, and the, and the universe back to planet Earth here, where we are very locally uh, located, right? Mm -hmm. Going fast forwarding to the past a uh, couple hundred years ago, I want to focus in the 19th century, two main figures that represent evolution and genetics. And these names are uh, so well known, even though the many people don't necessarily know much about genetics or evolution, at least they've heard the names. And most people have heard of these names, probably have heard more about Darwin than Mendel, Gregor Mendel. Okay? But by the end of this course, you will have heard about both pretty much well. <laughs> So these are two figures that we're going to delve into in more detail. And that was, during, they lived in the 1800s or 19th century. Again, a little technicality as we go along so as to bring everyone on board on the same page. When we talk about centuries, remember that the century is always one number uh, ahead of the hundreds, right? So when I talk about the 19th century, what hundreds am I talking about? Exactly, 1800s, all right? And that's simply because when you take it to the first century AD, I know Domini, the first century of the Christian era, right? The first hundred years. So they were in the, uh, the two-digit number. So for example, the year one, the year two, the year three of the Christian era, right? When Jesus was walking around physically on earth, uh, there in Palestine, uh, what is today the state of Israel. That's year one, year 10, year 20. He must have, uh, uh, we think that he was uh, tortured uh, around the year 33, 34, more or less of his life. Um, so all those years up to year 99, year 99 is the first century, first century, right? And then beginning with the year 100, that's the beginning of the second century, the year 100. And so the second century is in the hundreds. The third century is in the 200s and so forth. So when you bring all that argument forward to today, we are in the year 2023, we are in the 21st century, see? So the century number is always a number ahead of the hundreds number. In other words, all that to say that Mendel and Darwin lived in the 1800s. In fact, in the middle of the 1800s, 1850s, uh, they spanned the middle of that century of, of uh, now this is two centuries ago. And then what happened is that even though they were contemporaries, they were in different parts of the world. Because again, most people know that Darwin was where? Lived where? Well, he lived in uh, what is the UK today, United Kingdom, right? Back then, the British Empire, one of the largest empires in the world back then, right? Fairly advanced for its age, including uh, ships and so forth. Of course, uh, the motor had not been invented yet, so all the ship shipping was being done by sail. And there's a lot of skill to sail the world, uh, especially when you have winds that are coming in the opposite direction and so forth, because that's the main means of locomotion. Anyway, that was Darwin in the in uh, the British Empire, which is today the United Kingdom, or England, basically. And Mendel, most people don't know where Mendel lived, but he did live in Europe, but it was not the islands of Europe, uh, like the British Isles or anything like that. It was in continental Europe. Uh, what is uh, the Czech Republic today? It's a town called Bruno. And in fact, Mendel was a monk. <laughs> he was an Augustinian monk, which are the monks who founded this university about 60 years ago, the Augustinians, okay? So he was a priest. And he is the one who came up with uh, the basic theories of uh, genetics, of inheritance. He called them inheritance factors. What do we call inheritance factors today? that we've been able to look at them even at the level of, at the molecular level. Well, phenotypically we call them traits, but genotypically it's the genes, the genes, right? 
those are the genes. He, he didn't have a microscope because he hadn't been invented yet. Um, but um, well, the microscope was around actually, but it was very, very primitive. Mm, he looked at traits. He looked at the expression of the genes, not the genes themselves, but he did intuit that there were these inheritance factors that were being passed on from one generation to the other. So that was the great genius there. All right, and then even though they were contemporaries, they really didn't know each other and did not correspond and so forth. So it took another almost 50 years to come up with about 50 years, half a century, to come up with what is known as the modern synthesis. The modern synthesis was to put these two theories together to give an overall explanation of the mechanics of evolution, how evolution occurs actually, all right? Because Darwin, as brilliant as he was with his theory of descent with modification, right? Descent with modification, in other words, the variation that comes from progeny from the next generation. He really did not have a mechanism at the detail level of really the, the genes. He had no concept about that. And therefore, these two theories really complement each other, but they didn't know of each other. Now, there's a little caveat that we was exposed to an article of Mendel, uh, but he discarded it, unfortunately. Otherwise, he could have had the whole glory of doing the modern synthesis uh, about half a century prior to when it was done, which is at the beginning of the 20th century. And the modern synthesis, as is known in biology, was precisely putting together Mendelian genetics with Darwinian evolution to come up with a bigger, broader picture of really of what we know today as population biology or ecology, which is the interaction of all the plants and animals and fungi and bacteria that live outside of these walls in nature. And it's the biggest, most complex picture of the dynamic interaction of all the living creatures that are on the planet. Okay, That's uh, the nutshell of the modern synthesis. So the big branch of biology today is precisely population biology or ecology. And the key of interpretation there is precisely evolution and its mechanism genetics itself. All right, so I'm just giving you an overview for now. We're gonna get into all this in greater detail, obviously. Uh, moving forward then, as I mentioned, we have these two uh, figures of Gregor Mendel and Charles Darwin. You can see from their lifespan that they uh, overlapped, they were contemporaries, but in different parts of the world, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how their, their ages match so well. Uh, Mendel uh, was born about 10 years later, about 12, 13 years later than Darwin, but they died more or less at the same time. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Mendel died a little younger than Darwin, but certainly their adult life was pretty much contemporary. It's just amazing. One of these uh, coincidences or providences, right? So let's look at uh, Mendel a little closer. There's a, uh, an actual photograph, obviously in black and white because the camera was around back then, very primitive, okay? But uh, here's Mendel with his congregation of monks in the little town of Brno in what was then the kingdom of Bohemia. They were all kingdoms. <laughs> there were no states as such as we know them today, democratic states and so forth. They were kingdoms with kings and queens and all that like we have uh, read about and studied in, in history, right? And today is known as the Czech Republic. Before the break of the Soviet Union, it was Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. So, and Mendel, as you can see, is looking at one of his uh, pea plants there. <laughs> some of the monks are interested in it and some of the monks are not interested in it. So it's interesting to see how telling the, uh, the photo is, right? Uh, this was the abbot, the prior of the monastery. I, I don't know his name, but I'm sure these names are known. Uh, these two folks were more focused on um, uh, 
that's probably the Bible there. It's a good assumption that that was the Bible or some kind of a prayer book. And this fellow is pointing toward the prayer book. Don't miss the, uh, the dynamics here. Whereas these two fellows are more interested in what uh, Mendo had to say about his peas. <laughs> so, and this guy is kind of thinking about it, maybe sideways. <laughs> I find the photo interesting anyway. Here is just a representation of uh, uh, Father Mendel. That's why he's called the father of genetics, both ways. He was actually a Catholic priest and he was also the father, just like Darwin was the father of, uh, to this day is the father of evolution, right? But it's, a, it's an analogical father. Mm -hmm. Even though early on, uh, Darwin did think about the, the priesthood. I'll talk about that in a minute. So Mendel is here depicted with his uh, pea plants, right? And he came up with uh, what is today known as the Pune Square. That was a later Frenchman who developed these things to put the, um, the genotype of the male on one side and the genotype of the female on the other side and do the crosses, right? So if this sperm fertilizes this egg, this ovum, then we get this genotype and so on and so forth. You're familiar with that. Let me see if I can. Oh, also let me magnify this. Pretty locked. Oh, here. There we go. Oops. Yes. You can see on one of the axes, doesn't matter uh, which axis has which gametes. This one happens to have the male gametes on the y-axis, this one on the x-axis. Uh, because they're gametes, right, then fertilization is the fusion of these two gametes. And then we get a diploid cell. We get a cell with a full complement of um, chromosomes. This obviously is focusing only on one particular trait. Again, what Darwin, I'm sorry, what Mendel observed was the trait itself, what was visible to his eyes. He did not see the genotype. He did not see the genes of the ova or the sperm. What's a sperm in plants? Because he was working with peas, right, with plants. What's a sperm in plant? Exactly. It's a springtime, you just wash your car, and 10 minutes later, it's covered with a yellow film of dust. What is that yellow film of dust? Pollen. <laughs> and the pollen is the plant version of sperm. In fact, each pollen grain, which individually is microscopic, has two sperm nuclei inside. But basically, the point here is that pollen is the genotype. It's the, it's the genetic material, right? That flies around until it goes to a plant, until it goes to a flower or a cone in the case of the pine trees, and those are the reproductive structures of plants. So inside either the flower or the cone, the pine cone, are the eggs, the ova, that will be fertilized by the pollen, all right? So what he was observing was the end result of that fertilization, which is what we call the phenotype or the expression, the expression. And it turns out that he found, um, seven characteristics that are what we call all or none characteristics, all or none characteristics, okay? Now, that's why this is called Mendelian genetics. And most genetics today we know is not Mendelian because there's a variety. You think, for example, of human height at the same age, right? Because if you alter the age, of course, a three-year-old is uh, normally uh, smaller than a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old. But at the same age, let's say we take all 10-year-olds or all 50-year-olds, right? We're going to find a variety of a variation of size in the general population. So that's variation there. We don't find just tall people and short people at the same exact height. That would have been Mendelian, that is said all or none characteristic. But in this pea plant, he found that there were seven characteristics that were all or none. Mm -hmm. And uh, with regards to these are, I guess these are four of them. Yes, these are four and there are three more that don't have to do with the pea itself. 
But these four, as you can see, have to do with the P. The P is either yellow or green. And the P is either smooth or wrinkled, right? Those are the four characteristics that are visible with regards to the P itself. So that makes four, right? Yellow or green is two and wrinkled or smooth is another two. When you combine them with these, you have four possibilities, right? Because you can have either a yellow that is smooth or a yellow that is wrinkled. Then you can have a green that is smooth or a green that is wrinkled. So that's four characteristics. There are three more that don't have to do with the P itself. Uh, two of them have to do with the pod. The pod is either smooth or contoured, all right? Uh, internet, come to our aid. Um, Darwin, how about Darwin piece? Just some kind of word. Here we go. Here. All right, I lost some resolution, but I think it's still be seen. Uh, not too well. Maybe the next one. Can I move it? And to find an image that has better resolution. Yeah, this one. All right, so with regards to the pod itself, the P pod, it's either smooth, right? Like these, or it's uh, contoured where the, let's say the skin of the pod is compressed around the P itself. So you can see the contour of the P, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, six P's in this pod. So that's either all or none. It's either contoured or smooth. Then the P, it's, the pod itself can also be either yellow or green in addition to the P. And you can have yellow P's in a green pod or green P's in a yellow pod or obviously yellow and yellow and green and green, okay? So they're independent characteristics and they're all or none. And finally, so that's two more. The, uh, the color of the pod and the contour of the pod. And the last one is the plant itself as a whole. The plant, actually the two more, yeah. The plant is either tall or short. The plant is either tall or short and the flower is either white or purple. So it's amazing that all these eight characteristics occur in this one plant. <laughs> and all of them are all or none, all right? The, the, uh, particularly this one, tall or short, they just have two types of plants. They're either short or tall for this particular species of uh, pea, all right? And the flowers, again, they're not pink flowers. They're either white or uh, purple or violet, et cetera, et cetera. So some people speculate that Darwin did some research before finding the pea plant that had these all or none characteristics because many other plants, think of roses, for example. The rose, the actual flower of the rose, so many different colors, right? Okay, so uh, that's not all or none. You don't have just red and white roses. You have pink, uh, purple, all variety of roses of the flower color. And most plants and most animals uh, are that way. There's variation. Uh, but this particular plant, that's, the, that's the, the characteristic. So some people speculate that he actually did some preliminary research on other plants that he could cultivate in the monastery, right? Uh, that didn't work for him, but this one did. But there's no record of it. He just didn't keep a record. So we, we can only speculate, but the fact that he found this one plant that had up to eight characters. And the interesting thing is he could validate his theory of the inheritance factors with all eight characteristics independently or together. So 
also he was a mathematician. His father was a mathematician and a teacher in mathematics and so forth. So he knew how to work the numbers well, and especially statistics, which technically is not a branch of mathematics. It's considered its own field, but has to do a lot with probability, the issue of sample and population, right? How representative is the sample of the entire population? Because again, let's use our intuition. Um, it's obvious that in the monastery, he could not have a, an entire population of all the pea plants in the world. <laughs> so he had to have a sample. And that sample, how many pea plants did he actually have to observe for that sample to be representative? Okay, well, one way to get around that a little bit so they didn't have to cultivate hundreds and hundreds or maybe thousands of pea plants, right? Because that's a very labor intensive. He could look at various characteristics. And if the same law holds for all of the various characteristics that he's looking at, then that's a kind of a way of getting around the sample size. So most likely he did not need to do that many pea plants because he's looking actually at eight characteristics that are all or none. And if the results always come out in the predicted way, well, that makes that statistic very robust. We say it's robust. The high percentage, the alpha value, right? It's a very high probability that, that, uh, that the same phenomenon occurs in all of the pea plants, right? And that's how he was able to come up with this uh, theory of the inheritance factors. Mm -hmm. The independent assortment and the segregation and also the independent segregation of uh, the chromosomes during uh, mitosis or meiosis. All right. Now, in humans specifically, so Mendelian genetics is known as Mendelian genetics is all or none characteristics is kind of rare. It's not found too much in nature. The most common one is uh, multi-variation, like variation in skin color, variation in height, variation in eye color, in hair color, all of the characters, all of the traits we can think about, variation in the length of arms and so forth. Seldom do we have what we call all or non characteristics. There are a few, and they're mostly, they mostly lead to uh, defects, right? Defects because, especially on the recessive side, the, the genes, on the genes that have uh, the weaker uh, uh, trait. So this is a list here of Mendelian characteristics in the human. Albinism, which is lack of melanin, right? Uh, skin uh, protection or color blindness, cystic fibrosis, hemophilia is also, uh, people are either carriers or express the hemophilia depending on the genes they got from their parents or no hemophilia at all. Sickle cell anemia also is all or none. tay sachs so most of them are diseases and they are Mendelian uh, diseases because it's a Mendelian inheritance. Mm. A few others also don't have any mm. illness associated with them, like the capacity to roll the tongue or not. That means that you roll the tongue, right? Most people can roll the tongue, but some people cannot roll their tongue. <laughs> and so that's an all or not characteristic. Now, once it's to roll your tongue, but roll your tongue and talk at the same time, that's a different story, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's like walking and chewing gum. Some people can do it, other people can't do it. <laughs> All right. So Dominant or recessive, right, oh, all right, well, right, exactly. But the expression of those conditions is either all or none, that's Mendelian. But what we find in, in fact today in, in genetics is that there is mixed expression, there's co-dominance or, um, or incomplete dominance and pleiotropy, and there are many variations on things that we have discovered today. But he got the ball rolling basically by the whole issue of inheritance factors. Because, I mean, think about it. 
what he was, oh, something I forgot to mention, which is crucial. <laughs> How was he doing these crosses, the crosses? All right, the crosses were done by taking pollen from one plant and fertilizing the flower of another plant or even self, self fertilization. Okay, uh, let me, this is going to be illustrative if I put here uh, Mendel crosses. See if it gives us an actual photo. No. no. The actual technique uh, is what I'm looking for. Because it's with a pencil brush, he takes the pollen from one stamen and has to pollinate in the pistol of the other uh, flower where the eggs are. So it's a little detail, it's labor intensive, but it can be done. Mm, and, uh, technique maybe, let's see. Here we go, okay. This will work. All right, this is a self-pollination. It takes, see flowers, what we call complete flowers. Complete flowers have both male and female structures within them. The center of the flower, which is uh, the pistil here, at the base of the pistil is the ovary. Inside the ovary are the ova or the eggs, unfertilized, just waiting. Okay, that's standard for any uh, sexual reproduction in plants and animals. And then the stamen are what holds the uh, pollen grains. The pollens are at the head of the stamen. So that's the male structure because the pollen has uh, sperm inside. So he would take a flower, for example, and dip the pencil brush, you know, pencil brush, dip it on the stamen, pick up some of that pollen, right? And then he would cut out the other stamens and fertilize either that flower or another flower that from which he had cut off the stamens to eliminate the other pollen. So now he knows that he's using this purple pollen. You see, because this is a purple flower, he's using this purple flower. If he's doing a surf, a self cross or a self fertilization, then the eggs are also purple eggs. So that was the first step. And you notice whenever he did that, he always got the purple flowers. When he did it on fly fl white flowers, he always got white flowers. But when he did the test cross of taking, let's say purple pollen and fertilizing white eggs, understand white eggs coming from a white flower, that's the cross fertilization. Let me see, I can move this way, good, I can move this way. This is, what he got, he got this ratio, average ratio of three to one. This is a famous average of three to one. He would get, when he would cross a purple flower with a white flower, either the sperm or the egg. So the sperm could be purple and the egg could be white or the sperm could be white and the egg could be purple. Either way, you always get this ratio of three to one three purple and one white. And it's significant that it, the purple was the majority, was three fourths, and the white was the minority. For a mathematician, this would have a lot of meaning. The first meaning is that purple is dominant, obviously because it's beyond 50%. So purple is dominating. Now, this is the brilliance of his mind. He put this mathematically. Not only was the purple dominant, the purple was always dominant by 75%. And the white was always recessive or non-dominant by 25%. So that percentage is meaningful because it happens that there are four 25% in a hundred. There are four 25% and there are four possibilities here, all right? And that's what got him thinking about dominant and recessive. Certainly purple is dominant, number one, but if I'm taking genes from one male and genes, or where I'm taking factors, falling, from, which is the male, and I'm taking egg from the female, 
how can it be this half and half, the combination of half and half gives me three quarters and one quarter. It must be that one of these two is the dominant. One of these two halves is the dominant and the other half is not the dominant. And the dominant has to be the purple. So if it's either purple sperm and white egg, he will get this ratio. Then he would flip it. He would do purple egg and white sperm and he would still get purple dominant. So I said, okay, so the purple is dominant on the three to one ratio. And the white is recessive. That's why it's also important that it's all or none. If he started getting pink flowers, all right, then that's a problem. It's more so difficult to interpret. So is eye color always interesting recessive on both sides? Eye color for humans? Um, I don't know, but uh, just thinking about it a little bit intuitively, typically the recessive is the least common. And therefore, the most common eye color is brown. However, within the brown, there is variation from very dark brown, which actually looks black, to very light brown, which almost looks like blonde, right? But it's different from uh, blue or green, which can also be a variety between green and blue. But definitely, overall, there are more brown eye people than green eye or blue eye people. And so, yes. But within that, there is variation, okay? So the, the fuller genetic uh, issue is more complicated than just all or none. And that's why there is genius actually in simplicity because it allows one to develop a model and then test that model. And he kept getting the same ratio. So that was, that made it very robust. But the reality, excuse me, we know today is that genetics is much more complicated than this. And he definitely got the ball rolling and thinking and getting us thinking about what is being transmitted somehow inside that pollen and inside that egg, there are these inheritance factors, all right? And they're physical, biological. Now we know today that they are chemical and it's fact, it's the chromosome, it's the DNA. It took another 50 years to come up with the theory of inheritance by DNA itself, because the molecule was known already at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, but it was thought that it was mostly proteins were doing the inheritance because there is a much greater variety of uh, proteins than there is of DNA, just at the level of the, protein, uh, the molecule as a whole. So that was um, the CERN that was uh, <clears throat> discovered really in the first half of the 20th century the fact that DNA was the inheritance factor and not proteins. But that's 50 years later than this. Okay, so here's a little more detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. You get a certain result, then you want to see if that keeps coming up the way here. Right. We call it validating the results. Right. When each study comes around, you want to do different things in the mix, or you want to... Yes, and those are the tests, right? That, uh, that's what we call the experimental design. The first thing we need, we need a control. And the control is without the effect that we're testing. So for example, if we're testing a, a drug, a medication, the, the control is a placebo, right? That it has everything. It's a sugar pill that has everything about the pill except the actual medication, <laughs> except the actual chemical. And so that should not produce the healing or the effect that the medication is producing, right? So we have controls and sometimes there are positive controls, sometimes negative controls. Uh, so that's all in the experimental design. And then it's refined and refined uh, until we come to a statistical probability. And there are three levels at least of uh, statistics that are needed is known again the alpha value or the probability uh, 95 percent is the minimal for being able to publish it for example so that other labs other parts of the world can reproduce that same experiment all right 95 percent typically is the minimal in science in empirical science confidence yes exactly confidence interval, exactly or if we were presented in the alpha value it would be 0 0.05 right 0 0.05 
The next level of rigor is 99%, so 0 0.01. And the higher rigor is 99.9% uh, .9 or 99.99%. It depends on the study really, when you're doing medication for humans, you want a very, very uh, high uh, probability that the thing is working because we're talking about human lives. If it's something else, if we're working with bacteria or amoebas or something like that, then the probability can be lower because the design is, is essentially cheaper to do the experiment with a lower probability. You have to use fewer individuals and so forth, but then you keep refining, right? So there are iterations that are done. A lot depends on what we're testing, really, what we're testing. Okay, uh, get back to the slides. Sometimes I tend to fly off. <laughs> I think that's enough uh, for Mendo for now that he gives us the bottom line is this inheritance factors that are based on probability, all right? And getting essentially the same result over and over again. And it's a very tight uh, experimental value that he was getting of let's say hundreds or maybe even thousands of uh, pea plants that um, he tested. The variation from the theoretical ratio, uh, let's say, let's take a thousand. The theoretical ratio would be, uh, well, this one that I had earlier, the simpler one, the three to one, where are you? Okay, the three to one is, if we take it to 100 is 75 versus 25, right? 75, uh, actually um, yellow <laughs> is dominant in this case. 75 yellow, 25. When he did the actual experiment with 100 plants, he would get like 74, 26 or 76, 24. Very, very tight. The experimental result was very, very close to the theoretical proportion, all right? And so uh, that's astonishing that it was so, so tight and, and uh, because he was very rigorous in doing his experiments. So the data uh, had a lot of, credibility to it. All right, he published that. And I'm gonna leave it there for now in a mathematical kind of an obscure mathematical journal of the time, but he published it. Let's uh, move over to Darwin for a while. And Darwin was born during this Victorian era of uh, the British empire, which was expanding. The British empire was expanding at the time you can see here in the background of this design, the ship, uh, which was called the Beagle, just like the dog, the Beagle, right? His Royal Majesty, HSM Beagle, His Royal Majesty's uh, ship, because all of the ships of the British Empire at that time uh, belonged to the crown, to the, to the queen or the king, right? And they were doing trade. Here's an actual photo of Darwin again, because they're contemporary, so the camera is around and it's gonna be black and white because that's what was available then uh, in his latter years. Mm. Here's a young Darwin in the Galapagos Islands, right? Uh, which was the voyage that he did with his uh, ship. Now, let's go back a little bit. Darwin in his youth was, uh, growing up and uh, I think it was London and his professors, even in high school and college, many of his professors were clergy, were priests, Anglican, of course, because that was a religion of uh, uh, England to this day. In fact, to this day, the queen is the head of the Anglican church, <laughs> all right? Because there's an official liaison or concordat between the church and the state of the British Empire <laughs> to this day. So uh, many of his, it was fashionable for priests to study and to be professors also. And they would teach in the university, so and colleges and high schools, the Lyceum, which is kind of a mix between college and high school. Basically, uh, it's, it's a European system. A number of his uh, professors were actually priests in, in science. And the big science back then was geography. 
The big science was geography. Why? Because of trade. And so the big thing was to discover ports of call throughout the world where they could do trade. And that meant money, right? That meant the economy. See, the economy of, of these empires were boosted a lot by trade, bringing in spices from the Orient, bringing in woods from uh, Latin, uh, South America, precious woods and so forth that we worked for making all kinds of stuff, right? And so trade was very big and that's where the money was, the merchants. And so that fed all of the fields of knowledge back then. And geography was about cartography, was about uh, designing the coastlines of all the different continents of the world where ships could dock uh, either natural ports or man-made ports for trading. And so that was a big push. Now, when Darwin was young, he for a while was thinking about becoming a priest himself, an Anglican priest, because it's natural that professors have an influence on the young minds and a number of his professors. He always loved nature anyway. and was very observant about things, uh, but uh, also like some of his professors who were scientists and uh, clergy at the same time. But then a, an uncle of his wanted to dissuade him from the priesthood and just wanted him to concentrate on the empirical sciences. So he got him a position on this ship, uh, which was called the Beagle. Hmm. Not quite <laughs> His, uh, Royal Majesty, or his HSM, his Sovereign Majesty Beagle <laughs> was the name of the ship. All right, and that's the guy back there. Now, the Beagle was an expedition. It was essentially a scientific geographical expedition that was going around the world, mostly around the equator, uh, for cartography, for designing, for measuring the coastlines of the different continents around the world, around the equator, where the trade was more abundant because there's more biodiversity and all that. Okay, and it was supposed to last several months, that expedition, and then go back to uh, London and the cartographers would take all that experimental data that was gathered of the um, contours of the coastlines and then develop the actual maps by hand that we've seen on parchment or uh, so forth, uh, or um, papyrus, which was getting close to paper, and, uh, et cetera. Maybe paper was actually around at that time. Anyway, you see these old illustrations from uh, 17, 1800s and so forth. So mapping the coastlines of the world was a big thing and there was money for it. Darwin is assigned here as the only biologist, as the only naturalist of the crew. And the ship got getting delayed and delayed and delayed. It actually took about five years to complete the whole <laughs> uh, thing. So by that time, it gave Darwin a lot of time to collect species of plants and animals and fungi. These are examples of uh, some of the fungi that he collected and he would draw them on paper. Yeah, so paper was definitely around and compare it. For example, I use the fungi here because you notice that mushrooms that were being uh, used by the Yamamami Indians in Brazil, in the Brazilian Amazon basin, which was one of the ports of call that they did, you notice that the Yamamami Indians were using these mushrooms to poison their arrows, uh, their spearheads for hunting animals in the, in the jungle. And those same mushrooms were being sold in the marketplace in London. <laughs> so it threw him for a loop because people were not dying from eating those mushrooms in the UK. All right. And so variation. Obviously, it had to do with the soil where the mushroom was growing that was making the, po the mushroom poisonous or not poisonous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, that's not the case for all mushrooms. Some mushrooms are always poisonous no matter where you grow them. And not all poisonous mushrooms will kill you either. Some can make you very sick, but not kill you. Anyway, some are fatal. 
uh, and but there's some mushrooms are actually edible and some mushrooms are actually a delicacy and they sell very expensively throughout the world. All right, so it's a whole variety of there. But it got him thinking precisely about this variety, the tremendous variety, even within species. Mm -hmm. And the Galapagos, of course, he saw a lot of animals and plants that he hadn't seen there before. And they were uh, not afraid of humans, so he could get fairly close to them and study them and so forth. So he got them more and more thinking about this, his theory of evolution, descent with modification, descent with modification. Okay. Now, there's another anecdote also that as Darwin was coming up with his descent with modification, he was reluctant to publish once he went back to Great Britain, of course, and started writing and so forth. He was reluctant to publish his book on the origin of species because he knew that it would be scandalous to say that even humans came from other species, from prior species. And he was mocked and ridiculed that he was caric uh, characterized as a monkey with a Darwin's face, you know, because people misinterpreted his theory like we descend from the monkey. And so he was ridiculed and ostracized and so on and so forth. But some people did pay attention and started seeing um, the, the validity of his theory of descent with modification. I keep saying that, we'll look at it in more detail. But one aspect of it was, there was another fellow, um, Alfred Wallace. Alfred Wallace was a contemporary of Darwin, younger than him. And he was out in Polynesia somewhere in Asia and uh, looking at uh, variation in species also. Wallace was younger than Darwin, uh, but uh, a contemporary of his. And when he was young out there looking at uh, plants and animals in Polynesia, <laughs> here's some uh, caricatures that were coming up at the time, right? He also came up with the theory of evolution of descent with modification. So he wrote a, an article and he sent a draft of the article, Wallace sent an, a draft of the article to Darwin in the 1850s, okay? Which was essentially Darwin's theory, but independently. And Wallace was just looking for Darwin's opinion. And when Darwin saw that article, he says, he said to himself, I better publish because otherwise this guy's got to publish it and he's going to get the credit for evolution. So that's what finally motivated Darwin. I think it was like in 58, 1858, that he finally went ahead and published his uh, book, his theory of evolution by means of natural selection, which he had been working on for years and years and had the raft, but didn't have the courage to publish it. Okay, so that's the anecdote that uh, Wallace was the one who motivated him by that draft of the article that he sent to what Darwin. Anyway, there's another anecdote about Darwin from his um, cousin, who was a physicist and mathematician who was um, okay, the name will come to me because I have these senior moments occasionally. But uh, this uh, fellow who was a cousin of uh, Darwin and was a physicist and mathematician, he had read the article that Mendel published in that obscure mathematical journal. And his cousin, he knew that about Darwin's theory because they had talked about it. And the anecdote goes that his uh, cousin gave Darwin the article saying, look, this may be, this may be of interest to you because this may be the mechanism for explaining your theory, right? So that you don't have to be ridiculed and you have to prove the actual uh, proof of how evolution is occurring, right? Because when you look at, when you read, I don't know if any of you read the origin of species, highly recommend it, uh, but it's all qualitative. There's not a single formula in it. There's not a single reference in it. Like typical, you know, any scientific paper will have references. There's not a reference to it. It's all 
by credibility. He's making the argument of intuition by relating, you know, the lion and the tiger look alike and the panther, they all look alike. So they must have a common ancestor. And so that kind of the type of argument that he's making throughout his whole book, but with so many species of plants and animals and fungi throughout the world, that it's very compelling and convincing, all right? But he doesn't give a single reference, a single citation or any mathematics, it's totally qualitative. So the inheritance factors of Mendel would have been very useful for him to say, and by the way, this is the mechanism, <laughs> or this is a possible mechanism. Now, the rest of you who are younger than me, go ahead and experiment and see if you can find this inheritance factors, <laughs> right? So he could have catapulted, in other words, he could have done that synthesis himself, which otherwise took about 50 or 60 years, closer to 70 years in the 1920s. Uh, so we could have been, you know, half a century more advanced in science than we are today. Another way of saying that is, where are we gonna be in 50 years from now? <laughs> Consider what's happening in the past 50 years of our lives, all right? I can tell you of my life because I've seen it since the 1970s to today, it's amazing, it's bewildering. Well, this certainly did exist back then uh, and space travel and so forth. So we could have been there 50 years ago, or 50 years earlier, or even 70 years earlier. Anyway, the response from Darwin for that article was that he put it aside because he didn't understand the math is the point that I want to get to, especially with our young students today, because the big boogaboo in college is math, you know, and the second big boogaboo is science, but math, everybody's afraid of math. And it was simple ratios, three to one ratio, which converting a ratio to a percentage to a decimal, you know, three to one means 75% or uh, point, uh, 25 to 0.75, but that simple conversion, many people freak out, they can't do it. They cannot convert a fraction to a decimal to a percentage and including Darwin apparently, <laughs> because he could have had the whole thing. He couldn't understand the math of the, of the article of Mendel's article, so he put it aside. So when I say that they didn't have contact with each other, we have to qualify that, that Darwin did have some access or was, and anyway, exposed to Mendel's stuff, but Mendel was not exposed to Darwin's stuff, at least that we know of, because Mendel was secluded in a, in a monastery and he wasn't necessarily really, well, Darwin had not published anyway to begin with. And Mendel was concentrating on, on the math of uh, his research on the quantitative part, okay? So these are ironies of history as uh, we go forth. Bottom line for Darwin, Descent with modification. Think about it functionally. I always tell my students think functionally. Descent with modification means that we are a variation of our parents. We have some of our parents' eye color. We have some of our parents' uh, hair color, length of arms, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not identical. We're not clones of our parents. Okay, so there's a little variation. For example, you have siblings. Let's say we have four siblings, uh, two boys and two girls, and they all four have the same father and mother, you know, the boys will be similar to their father, but not identical. And the girls will be similar to their uh, mother, but not identical. Even if those siblings are identical twins, even if the two boys are identical twins and the two girls are identical twins, they're identical to each other, but not to their parents. So the descent, which are the progeny, the offspring, the children, are similar but not identical. That's the modification, descent with modification. When we have the, this descent with modification over time, generation after generation after generation, typically remember evolution works with generally long periods of time, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years is even better, it may lead to variation. The variation becomes diverse enough that we may actually have new species coming up. So diversion or the, uh, this modification eventually may lead to what we call speciation, new species coming up. In other words, 
at some point, these progeny are so different from each other that they don't really recognize each other. Therefore, they're not going to mate with each other, and therefore, they become new species. Okay? But it's all in the realm of probability. And here we are again, having to go back and forth between a deterministic world and a probabilistic world. What do I mean by that? We are not a probability. We are exactly four people in this room right now, plus the two others who are online, okay? So uh, we're not approximately four people right now. We are exactly four people. That is a determined. And I'm not a probability of a human. I'm exactly a human, right? But the probability that we would be here today is a probability, <laughs> it's, it's a percentage, you know, it's an average. There's a high probability that we'll be here today. I had the expectation that 100% of us would be here today. And it turns out that uh, four of us are here and two are virtual. So the experimental result did not match the theory, <laughs> right? I see the probability of being here today. We can talk about that. But once we're here, then we go into deterministic. And that's the challenge in bioethics and in science. Many times we have to go back and forth between these two models of deterministic or probabilistic, right? But probability at least helps us for developing a model, trying to project into the future based on past. Like uh, medicine, the, the art and science of medicine is probabilistic because the doctor, when they prescribe a medication, they don't say, this will heal you. No, uh, they'll say, there's a 99% chance that this will heal you because out of 100 people who took this medication in the past, 99 got healed, right? So you see, it's a probabilistic science and art, right? All right. That's right. We can, we can introduce probabilistic model into the pro-choice, pro-life uh, argument of when life begins, it's a probability that it begins there, you know, but in fact, we know today from, from precisely from biology that the beginning of human life is not a probability, it's an actual deterministic because an actual physical fusion of egg and sperm of the same species, all right? So we can bring it down to deterministic because there's actual physical material there. Now, there's a probability if a couple, um, is having intimacy is a probability that they'll have a, a boy or a girl. And what's the chance overall? 50-50, that's a probability. But once the event happens, then we're out of the probability. <laughs> you know, it's deterministic. So the four forces that he's proposing essentially are these four forces. Mutation, migration, drift, and selection, all right? These are, he didn't flesh them out in such detail, but fast forwarding, because we cannot spend all the time back two centuries ago, you know, we get it to come up to date. Today, essentially, these are the four forces or events that allow for the possibility of evolution to occur. Mutation, migration, drift, and selection. And we're gonna devote at least one lecture to each one of these. So I'm just giving you an overview today without getting into the details. Mutation also includes uh, genetic recombination or chromosomal recombination, which is an actual physical biochemical event that happens when the cell is splitting. Migration is also known as gene flow. We think of any animal or plant or fungi as a bag of genes <laughs> that is moving from one area to another physically, all right? That's migration. It could be immigration or emigration. Genetic drift, which has to do with chance, chance event, because we are precisely, we are deterministic individuals and chance happens. A lightning falls on the gorilla who was about to mate. Well, that gorilla is now not going to mate because it just got fried, all right? It's chance, wrong place at the wrong time. All right, a natural selection, ultimately natural selection is really the overarching mechanism that is capable of causing evolution. And I'll just say this for now because we'll devote at least one lecture, maybe several lectures to natural selection, but it's a selecting out. And it's a selecting out of the weakest. And nature does that kind of automatic. Another way of saying that is the survival of the fittest that you have heard about, the survival of the fittest. But the fitness is not 
gym physical fitness, you know, that I went to LA fitness and I've been there every day for two hours. That's not the fitness that we're talking about. It's not specifically muscular, it's a genetic fitness. It's a genetic fitness, okay? So the survival of the fitness has to do with the genotype really. And then the expression of that genotype, which is what we call the phenotype. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll leave it at that for now because we'll get into it in more detail. Now, the synthesis itself, I think, uh, let me see, we'll go about halfway well. So this is a good moment to, no, let me do the synthesis and then we'll break right after this. I need a little bit more forward into the 20th century. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Meyer in a minute, but basically he's the author of this book. And as you can see, he lived 101 years. <laughs> okay, folks, I just came back from Rome. That's why I had to postpone this lecture, celebrating the 100th anniversary of my Zia Egidia, my aunt Egidia, who was a uh, sister to my uh, father. All that generation is now gone on both sides of my family. But aunt Egidia is still there with 100 years old. And last week we celebrated her birthday over there in Rome. We had uh, uh, panettone, which is an Italian uh, sweet bread with uh, spumante, and it was a very Italian thing. We enjoyed it very much. And there are prayers with her and for her. She's still lucid, very feeble, but still lucid. She's a little hard of hearing, a little uh, can't see well, but otherwise she's alive. And it's amazing that uh, imagine everything that a person has seen in 100 years. Right? She was born in between the two wars. So she lived in Rome throughout the whole Second World War and survived that. That is not, is, is got a feat. So Meyer lived 101 years and this book he published toward the end of his uh, life. So it's a very, it's an excellent book is what I wanna say. It's an excellent book. He was part of the modern synthesis of uh, Mendelian genetics and uh, Darwinian evolution, that's called the modern evolutionary synthesis. He's also the one who gives us the biological definition of species, all right? The, since then, and he did this uh, last century, toward the beginning of last, so about 100 years ago. Uh, since then, there have been other definitions of species, ecological and so forth, but the biological definition of species is very useful. It's very useful because it really brings it down to the egg and the sperm. In other words, the fertilization process and passing on those genes. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. I just want to mention uh, three other fellows who were involved also in um, the modern synthesis. Uh, Fisher, Haldane, and Wright. They are also... Uh, co-founders, if you will, of what we call population biology. Population biology is the end result of the modern synthesis, of putting together genetics with evolution, because it's the bigger picture. What do we get from population biology? We get ecology, all right? Now, for example, looking, uh, going back to medicine as an example, for the purpose of study in medical school, the different organs and systems of the body are studied anatomically and physiologically, right? So structure and function, the muscle system, the skeletal system, circulatory, et cetera, et cetera, and also functionally digestion, circulation, the immune system. But for the purpose of study, they're broken up into whole lectures and whole courses. There'll be a course on immunology. There'll be a course on the skeletal system and so forth. But that's for the purpose of study. If we had on top of this table, the 12 organ systems that make up a human being, you know, the nervous system, the skeletal system, the digestive system, and we had all of them intact but separate, we don't really have a functional human being, right? <laughs> we have 12 organ systems, but we have to put all those organ systems together to work together functionally. And then we have a, a live human being, the same with every other organisms in in, uh, in nature, but it's not just the individual organisms living independently. Again, there is a collaboration between all of the organisms. There's an interaction rather between all of the organisms on earth, more or less proximal, close to each other. And that's what makes population biology or ecology, ecology as a whole. So the more realistic picture 
is really ecology. The more realistic picture of biology is ecology because that takes into account the interaction between the species. It's not just me alive, it's also the bacteria in my gut. So as far as the bacteria is concerned, I am a condominium for them. <laughs> my gut is a condominium. And without that bacteria, I'm gonna have diarrhea every day and I'm gonna die, all right? And therefore, it really, it's an, we're walking ecologies. <laughs> And then we put together the food that I eat. I didn't, I didn't, pre I prepare, but I didn't produce. So someone else produced that food. So you can see the web of interaction is pretty complex, right? And that's the true, uh, that's why this modern synthesis lands into population biology and ecology, which is the big field today, including many of the topics that we saw last semester. Right, so back to Meyer. It gives us the biological definition of species, right? How we are homo sapiens and not another species. And it has to have these two qualities, these two characteristics together. So there are individuals within the same group that are capable of interbreeding. Whether they actually interbreed or not is a different story, but at least capable. And that they produce fertile offspring. So let's continue with the human for now. Because, you know, human, I mentioned also last semester that we are the only species that is considered a single population throughout the whole world of the same species, okay? Theoretically, if we take a uh, man from China and a woman from Latin America who are in their fertile reproductive years and they're normal, they should be able to interbreed. They should be able to interbreed and have fertile offspring, theoretically. And that's the definite. So if they're capable of doing that, then that Chinese woman and that uh, Latin American man or vice versa belong to the same species. And we make the same argument for all the other animals, plants, fungi of the world. All right. So you can see it's a very functional definition that focuses precisely on passing on the genetic material to the next generation. So that's the first characteristic necessary but not sufficient because uh, the offspring also have to be fertile. And so it takes another generation to validate whether the parents are of the same species or not. Not until their offspring have themselves mated and produce offspring, fertile offspring, can we say then backtracking and saying, oh yes, those parents were of the same species because their children, their offspring are fertile. So the whole issue of fertility needs to pass on, okay? Now this is at the population level. Individuals may or may not be fertile for many reasons, but that's on the individual level. This is at the level of the group, at the level of the whole species. So as long as some individuals in the human population are able to interbreed with others, and have fertile offspring, then that validates the species concept, the biological species concept for that group. The same argument, again, is made for others, individuals. So we look at uh, lizards that look alike. Well, if they can reproduce and produce fertile offspring, it turns out that those lizards that look alike, they are from the same species. Because they may look alike, but not be exactly identical. You know, there's variation. <laughs> in some species, there's a lot of variation. In other species, there's essentially no variation. I don't know if you know guppies, for example, guppies, which are freshwater fish in aquariums are very common in the, the tropical fish uh, store. All right, guppies, the male and the female look very different. The male is fancy, we call it fancy guppies, and the female uh, guppies uh, are not that pretty looking at all because they're mostly at this point, they've been inbred so much that they're basically just reproductive machines. Uh, And so they're not the fancy, it, it happens that it's the male, it's the female that's selecting on the male. So that's a general thing in, in nature that the male is more fancy, more exotic because the female is actually selecting. Those phenotypes are supposed to be, represent genetic fitness, <laughs> genetic fitness. Uh, guppies. Yeah, of course they're gonna give us the fancy <laughs> guppies, which are the males. But uh, so here's a female, for example, you can tell also by the size, uh, 
or the body size and so forth. Here's an example. Here's uh, the male, the female of the same species. So sometimes they're not as, um, as similar, but even within the males, right? Um, as you can see, just scrolling through, all these are many different uh, uh, males of uh, here. These are all males and look at how different they are. But are they copies, right? The species, well, we would uh, mate them and see that they produce offspring and then those offspring can mate and look similar with a fancy tail, different color patterns and so forth. They say, yes, they are the same species. Mm -hmm. That's the offspring. Little tiny guys. You got to take them out because otherwise the adults will eat them up. <laughs> you got to segregate them, which is also very common in nature. So he gives us the biological definition of species, which is still a functional definition today, valid for at least for our purpose, for the purpose of evolution, it's good enough. All right. And so we're going to stick with it. And And so uh, the book, also I like uh, Meyer because <clears throat> he's a scientist, but he has the courage. He was one of the few scientists who had the courage to also go into philosophy and theology and critique it. So that's on the good side. The bad side is that because he did not have real formal training, especially in theology and religion, <clears throat> being mostly an empirical scientist, he ends up critiquing religion specifically uh, Christianity and Catholicism in particular because of the repression that the Catholic Church did of, um, of scientific and vast name. Remember the Galileo affair and all that back 500 years ago and ends up saying, well, because of the repression that religion did on science, on the advancement of science, we are behind schedule. We could have been much more advanced today if that repression had not gone on. So. <laughs> Uh, 500 years ago and back, further back, but even into his own time, into Darwin's time, into the 17 and 1800s, uh, mostly from the fundamentalistic perspective of interpreting the Bible literally. I'll have much more to say about that issue of interpreting the Bible literally, fundamentalism. Of, for example, we can bring it down to the six days of creation where they were being interpreted as six days of chronological of 24 hours. <laughs> That got us into trouble. That got them into trouble because certainly evolution does not work on an hourly basis. It works on hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years, except possibly for bacteria and the superbugs that I'll talk about also because that since their generation and their ideal conditions can be every 20 minutes, then we can fast track generation after generation. What we need basically is not necessarily a long time, but we need a lot of generations, we need a lot of iterations. <laughs> and in bacteria that happens fast, quickly, because on the right yeah. conditions, we can do that. But in nature, it happens slowly because generations come about very slowly, okay? Uh, um, so it's not necessarily the, the time factor as such. That time factor is in relation to the number of generations that is needed for evolution to take place. It's a gradual process, okay? So that's a good moment here to stop because now we're gonna get a little bit more into the scientific classification, which I can go faster because of your biological background and then talk about Meyer and the chapters that you need to read from here. All right, we've been at it for a couple of hours. So it's a good little time to break or to break a little bit. Any questions or comments before the break? No? Okay, I know that some of you online need to go to a game, so I'll continue recording uh, after the break, but I'm gonna pause now and let's see, 10 minutes, all right? So it's 11.30 almost, I'm gonna start at 11.40. All right, here we go. Okay, welcome back. So I remembered over the break, looked it up actually, it was Francis Galton, who was the cousin of um, Darwin who was physicist, mathematician, and who had spotted that article from Mendel and showed it to Darwin. Okay. 
Francis Galt. Anyway, back to now the 20th century and I'm gonna pick up on Meyer again in a moment, just a few more things about uh, scientific classification of species. Uh, this is, when I talk about species, I'm talking about the living organic species, right? Not in a philosophical term, but in a biological way. We group them for, again, for the purpose of study. And these are categories that are more or less inclusive, depending on which direction we're going. If we're going from the level of species up to domain, then categories are ever more inclusive. Whereas going backwards or going from domain down to species, the categories are ever more exclusive. Doesn't matter. Uh, I'll start from the main because there are fewer by definition. They're, they're the largest categories of living species, right? And there are three domains. And then the domains are subdivided into kingdoms, kingdoms into phyla, one phylum, several phyla. That's the terminology. Phyla are subdivided into classes, classes into orders, orders into family families, genus, and several, one genus, several genera is the plural, one genus, several genera. Genera are subdivided into species. And this is known as the Linnaean classification because of Carolus Linnaeus, who was a Swede in the uh, 1700s, 18th century, right? And he developed this classification to this day we use the Linnaean classification, which includes the species, includes also the genus. So like I mentioned earlier, Homo sapiens is our species name, according to the Linnaean classification. And Homo is a reference to the genus. So it's a little bit parallel to, we all have a first name and a last name. And if we have siblings, then we share a common last name, right? But the first name is individual. Uh, it's just that, for scientific purposes, the species also includes the genus name. This, you all know this by heart now. All right, let me just move forward quickly uh, to review here. This is just a graphic representation on how the categories become more and more exclusive as we get uh, smaller, essentially. Um, there are three domains. There are six kingdoms. So it's a little fuzzy, three dozen. Again, the, keep in mind that the scientific classification is also a work in progress. It's like a working document, okay? And there are species that are being reclassified all the time. And even larger groups are being reclassified and shifted back and forth. Uh, the more we discover mostly at the genetic level, the more this classification is uh, shifting a little bit or is being uh, reorganized. So, the biggest one is the one that is most certain right now, really, because it's the most inclusive one, which is domain. Already by the time we get to kingdom, it could be five or six, depending on how we classify them. And uh, the three dozen, that's why I put it in dozens, because it could be 34, 35, 36 uh, phyla, again, depending on how they're classified, mm -hmm. and so on down the line. Uh, Again, you know this already, but uh, just to review it, here are the six kingdoms that I was mentioning. Mm, three domain, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. And the sixth kingdom, again, the archaea are also considered a kingdom in their own. Bacteria can include the cyanobacteria, which have do photosynthesis, actually. So they're producers, whereas the other bacteria the not cyanobacteria are all consumers. Mm. When we get into the eukaryotes, in other words, the ones who have true nucleus in the cell, these four, but already the protist is a grab bag that doesn't have a rigor to it. It's a very mixed bag of organisms that are not really very united uh, genetically speaking. I'll mention, uh, I'll show you an example in a minute. Fungi are more uniform plants for sure because they all photosynthesize 
And then animals, by definition, we're all uh, consumers as far as food is concerned. We depend on the plants for food, for nourishment, directly or indirectly. But even here, we could tighten up the three domains even further down into two. Two biggest categories, the prokarya and the eukarya, otherwise known as also the prokaryotes or the eukaryotes. This has to do with the nucleus because in Greek, karyo is nucleus, all right? The nucleus of the cell I'm talking about. So prokaryotes don't have an organized nucleus. Uh, they do have a concentration of DNA, but they don't have an organized nucleus, meaning they don't actually have a nuclear membrane to enclose the DNA in a package. Whereas the eukaryotes, the prefix eu, EU actually means true or real, real nucleus with an actual membrane, which is a double membrane, just like the cell membrane is a double membrane, and it's much more organized than the prokaryotes, all right? So the DNA is more protected. <laughs> being in a bag within a bag, the first bag being the cell and the second bag being the actual nucleus. The DNA is really, really protected because again, mutation of the DNA may be uh, beneficial or damaging to the species. Most mutations actually are neutral. They don't have an effect because it's in the non-coding region, which is the mass, the vast part of the DNA is non-coding. All right, if we look at this a little uh, graphically, it looks uh, uh, like this. Here are the six uh, kingdoms, the most familiar animal kingdom, plant kingdom, the fungi, which look like plants, at least mushrooms look like plants because they're grown from the ground, but they're not plants at all. They don't photosynthesize, and therefore they're not producers, they're consumers. But they're a particular type of consumers. So all fungi are saprophytes, right? Just review for basic high school biology, they are decomposers. They feed on organic material that is rotting. And thanks be to God for the fungi because otherwise we'd be just sunk into rotten plants and animals that have died over the centuries and just sitting around and, and no one is decomposing them. So mm, fungi and bacteria and archaea are the big decomposers of the world. That's a good thing for recycling because nothing is wasted in nature. Everything is recycled. Then this, the kingdom is also known. Sometimes you run across this name, Monera, Monera, right? Or Monera. These include the bacteria and the archaea, which are both prokaryotic. In fact, I think I saw that we saw them uh, briefly uh, at the environmental uh, course toward the beginning. They both look very similar except for the bacteria have an extra layer in their cell wall. They have three layers on the sandwich of the cell wall, which uh, archaea only have two layers. In other words, it's the archaea are missing the slice of salami in between the two bread, okay? And the fact that they're missing that middle layer on the cell wall, then we speculate that they are more primitive. In other words, the middle layer was developed later by bacteria, and that makes them more recent, and that's the origin of the name archaea means primitive or something is archaic, something is primitive or old. Most of these archaea actually live in extreme environments. Again, we saw that briefly uh, last semester, the extremophiles, right? Either extreme uh, salty conditions or extreme heat like in geysers or boiling water, uh, extreme radiation. It's amazing how these extremophiles are able to survive in these harsh environments, which are remnants of the primitive atmosphere and the primitive earth where we go back millions of years ago when there was high volcanic activity, not much cloud covers, a lot of UV, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, this is a very simplistic classification of the species actually of the large groups. Uh, more realistic is this one. I don't know, I forget if I showed this diagram for environmental bioethics or not at the beginning, but this is a more actual, more uh, realistic diagram of today. You see the three domains are very distinct, right? Here's the bacteria, here's the archaea and the eukaryotes. But then once we go into the branching, it's very different. Uh, for example, uh, the fungi are here. <laughs> 
All right, so only these are the fungi. Imagine all of these other living creatures are not fungi, okay? And then um, the resolution becomes uh, blurry, but um, another category that we tend to think as, as huge is actually embedded mm, in here. For example, the algae. The algae are here. These are the algae. And this one is also algae. These are the land plants <laughs> over here. So it's a different way of classifying the organisms, mostly by their phylogenetics, by the percentage compatibility, that percentage compatibility, which is known as homology, right? Percentage homology, either at the genotype level or at the phenotype, which will be the protein expression. We can do uh, maps, these phylogenetic maps, looking either at the DNA or at the protein sequence. It's easier to, to sequence proteins than it is DNA, but what we're doing now with sequencers are becoming uh, more available and cheaper to run. And so more and more species are being sequenced, their genome is being sequenced, so we can do the blast and match and get a percentage homology of coding region or non-coding region, but the coding region is the one that really is expressing the genes. Is, is the one that contains the genes, sorry. All right, so for our purpose, this diagram is simple enough. When we talk about uh, descent with modification, we can look at these schemes. Oh yeah, I mentioned the protease. It's a grab bag because it includes very different organisms that are not really, uh, they're only distantly related phylogenetically. For example, the algae, and protozoans or euglenas and so forth, dinoflagellates. These are very diverse organisms that are only distantly related phylogenetically, but not closely related. In contrast with plants and animals, which are much more closely uh, related phylogenetically. Now, also another classification that is going to be useful for us. We actually saw this in um, the environmental course. So that's why I'm saying there's a lot of all of that here. I'm not gonna uh, belabor it too much, but the levels of complexity in nature, uh, this diagram gets us to the species, right? To the classification, but this is an artificial classification in the sense that uh, a lizard doesn't know it's a lizard, right? and so on and so forth. So we have imposed this linear classification on species just for the purpose of study. More realistic is this uh, type of um, complexity, levels of complexity. Again, starting with the individual species, member population, two or more individuals are the same species living in a specific region. These are the, the, the conditions for being a population. So what I'm trying to say here is that the word population biologically, scientifically has a very specific meaning. And it is two or more individuals of the same species within the same geographical region. Both have to be there, okay? Because we can have same species living in different parts of the world and they may be two different populations. The example I gave back then was the emperor penguin, remember? The emperor penguin, there could be emperor penguins in two different parts of uh, Antarctica, and they don't actually, those two populations don't meet. And if they ever met, they may not uh, recognize each other. We may see them identical to each other, but for example, the smell or their behavior, they will detect differences and therefore will not mix. One group is a little bit like ethnicities, or cultures in, in humans, they may not make simply because they're not of the same culture, all right? That's a simple analogy with us. Whereas for humans, uh, we are considered the same species and the same population because again, at least theoretically, any uh, man from one part of the world in reproductive years can uh, mate with any woman from another part of the world and vice versa and theoretically have fertile offspring. So that makes them the same species, but also one single population. We were not always a single population. If we go back before travel, especially travel with, with flights, with uh, airplanes, but even with ships, 
uh, we were very isolated. <laughs> we were different populations of the same species uh, back in historical time and in prehistorical time. But now with the advent of uh, uh, flight uh, transportation, mass transportation, and even long range transportation, we are considered a single population. We're the only species considered a single population throughout the whole world. I'm repeating stuff from last time. Um, this one also, biotic and abiotic factors, it's just terminology that is gonna come up when we talk about uh, evolution. The biotic factors is a reference to the biota, to the living organisms. Abiotic, the A typically negates the word, right? The A prefix, so non-living uh, phenomena. And this is a, a list here uh, of the, uh, we call them environmental conditions, right? Environmental conditions, including the composition of the soil, etc. All right. Now, uh, again, we'll have a lecture on each one of these, but uh, the evidence, the actual empirical evidence for evolution, hmm? uh, are these five main mm, phenomena the fossil record? comparative embryology, phylogenetics, percentage homology, the DNA or RNA as a universal genetic code, and finally, the bacterial resistance to antibiotics, otherwise known as the superbugs, mostly in hospitals. <laughs> That's why they kick you out 24 hours after the open heart surgery, <laughs> because these uh, superbugs are embedded now in hospital systems, air conditioning system, and so forth, and it's it's an issue, it's a concern. Anyway, uh, that's an example of uh, fast <laughs> evolution. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at them in more detail, but this is just an overall uh, scheme. And then finally, evolution itself, we can look at it uh, within the species, that would be, or within individuals, that would be microevolution, essentially the variation between individuals and a species. Or otherwise, if we back out to the whole group or even up to the phylum, then that would be macro evolution of an entire group. Like for example, the group of dinosaurs, right? Which were many different species. So that would be macro evolution. They occur at different scales and um, they look at different phenomena, whether it's micro or macro evolution. But um, we can say that in general, if microevolution occurs generation after generation after generation uh, selectively enough, it may eventually lead to macroevolution. So there's a, it's a time frame here that is uh, different. All right, I think uh, we're all good here. Uh, you've seen this so many times already. So let's uh, now take a look at Meyer for a moment. To bring one of the notes. Let me just run to my office quickly so that we can talk about the table of contents. Uh,
Okay, so when we were in high school, we would use, we would do these book inventories, right? I don't know if that's still done today, but basically it's just uh, taking a glance at the book throughout the whole thing, looking at the big picture, and you see that he has quite a few diagrams and charts and so forth. Those are all illustrative um, and they help a lot. The cladograms where you have phylogenetic trees, uh, sometimes known as the tree of life, etc. It's got a few photographs in there, some geography, then a glossary of terms, etc. That's overall. Uh, it's going to be placing a lot of emphasis on the fossil record because it's evident there's a bone there, and that bone is uh, is mineralized, right? It's become rock, but originally was not rock; was uh, part of uh, an organism that was walking around, that was living, it's a bone. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly hard tissue that gets mineralized, but sometimes also soft tissue. Uh, uh, fossil can also be an impression. It's not just the actual uh, part, body part, but it can be an impression like in the case of a leaf mm, or a footprint. That's also considered a fossil. All right, or it could be the actual organism embedded, typically in amber, in, um, in resin from uh, pine cones, from pine trees, like, uh, well, you also Jurassic Park movie and all that, but uh, small animals, sometimes uh, insects, typically, but sometimes even small mammals or reptiles have gotten embedded into uh, amber, into uh, resin and preserved for millions of years. Amazing. Okay. So you see uh, it's got uh, these uh, four parts, right? What, what is evolution, evolutionary change and adaptedness, then origin and evolution of diversity, and finally human evolution. The one that we'll see less is human evolution because I'm gonna use a more recent text for that. And I'll give you handouts on that, uh, plus the presentation itself. Right, for human evolution, because in his time it wasn't as advanced. But the other chapters, and we're not going to cover every chapter either, we're going to go to about um, uh, parts one and two, because mm -hmm. then it starts getting very, very technical. We don't need that level of technicality in this course, just essentially to prove uh, that evolution exists, that it does occur, and that it includes the human, that biologically we're not exempt from evolutionary uh, process or natural selection. But we're talking about primitive humans way before we had the sophisticated technology that we have today. We can say in brief that today's technology has kind of put us out of the loop of evolution because we have advanced much faster with technology than we have just by natural selection. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, more to say on that. Okay. So uh, for now, just uh, chapter one, uh, please take a look. And it combines a little bit of what I've been talking about. And I also send you a copy of my summary of chapter one, which is here. Let me see if I can magnify a little bit. Open this, yeah. So again, the same basic format, you know, you put the, uh, the name of the course or the lecture number somewhere for reference and then your name up there so I can identify it. He talks about these existential questions, right? The big questions, so who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Questions of origins, question of end. And like I say, I give him a lot of credit for getting into this because many scientists today put this aside and they just concentrate on the mechanics of what's happening, trying to describe processes and don't, don't consider much origins or teleology. Teleology is ultimate ends. Is there an afterlife? Uh, and if there is, then what does it look like, etc. So he has, uh, does some uh, historical perspective there, at least from the main cultures uh, in, in human history that have considered this, like uh, the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Babylonians and many ancient cultures, uh, 
even the cultures here in Mesoamerica, they all had belief. In fact, they were predominantly beliefs in the gods and the afterlife and sacrifices to the point of even human sacrifices, which today for us, it's so uh, aberrant and it's so repugnant, right? To, to do human sacrifices, but that was the mainstream of many cultures throughout the world way back. Mm -hmm. So we can say that religion and spirituality and, and intermix with magic and superstition have always been part of uh, human history and human culture. So he asks uh, some of these questions and he comes up with uh, three possible answers, uh, like the Greek world of uh, an infinite world of everything is recycled. There's really no origin and no end. Everything is, is in a cyclic basis. Or the other alternative is the Christian, actually he should say here, the Judeo-Christian version um, of the Bible. And therefore, um, in creation, this, the narrative of creation, specifically the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, which is the book of Genesis. I always find it kind of uh, interesting and I, and I chuckle a little because a lot of the argument against uh, the existence of God or the God, the, uh, God as creator that, that God has made us in his image and so forth. It's just based on one chapter of one book of the Bible. It's incredible. The Bible actually has 73 books in it. It's got 46 books on the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, right? And it's only, and of those, the book of Genesis is only one of those 73 books. And even within the book of Genesis, which has, I think, about 50 chapters in it, it's just the first chapter in the beginning where God created earth and the heavens and the earth and so forth. You know, it's that one little chapter <laughs> of one book, and that's the one, that's the controversial one. Well, how about the rest of all of the Bible, right, which says many other things about the human and, and nature and the universe? It's kind of excluded. All the controversies about that first chapter of that first book of the Bible which sadly he has interpreted as what we call creationism or a fundamentalistic interpretation of the Bible, which was standard. I don't fault him for that. It was a standard interpretation at the time, uh, even up until uh, last century with uh, actually about 150 years ago, what is known as <clears throat> the uh, critical um, uh, critical analysis of the text, realizing that it, we cannot take the text literally every passage of the Bible because we're going to run into big problems if we take, if we interpret every passage of the Bible literally, specifically referring to the first, the six days of creation, if we take that word day, which in Hebrew is yom, yom, as a 24-hour day, uh, it doesn't make any sense, all right, it doesn't make any sense, but is it really the intention of the author, not only the human author that wrote that chapter, that uh, book of Genesis, but the divine chapter, whom we call the Holy Spirit, was that the intention of that yom day of 24 hours? If we interpret it that way, the rest of the passage doesn't make sense. So there's an alternative interpretation as a period of time. We interpret that yom as a period of time then that period of time could fit into evolutionary time. <laughs> it's not restricted to just the week, the first week of, of creation, right? I've given you kind of the, the upshoot of the religious part or the, the, um, the theological end of this, uh, of this course. Anyway, go through it, read it, all right? But you have to read it also like critically trying to engage the text and see where he runs aground Precisely because he's a great scientist, but he's not necessarily a great philosopher or theologian. He did have the courage to, to go there, uh, but uh, he doesn't have that systematic background. Okay, so read it and read it uh, critically. Here's, uh, I sent you this. This is a uh, summary of it. He mentions the Copernican Revolution, uh, the 1500s, and then Lamarck, which was a precursor to uh, Darwin, at least he introduced the whole concept of uh, uh, adaptation, but Lamarck was off by the method that he was proposing. 
And then he gets into the whole question of origin, how it was interpreted early on with this scala natura. Scala natura or scala nature is from Latin, is the ladder of life. And every species or every group was at a particular rung on the ladder and there was no interchange. They were just kind of statically fixed in there because again, the idea, the naive idea that God put them in that category from more primitive to the top of the ladder, of course, who's gonna be at the top of the ladder? The human, right? Because we have many more capacities than all the other organisms have. And the more primitive the organism, the lower they were on the ladder and so forth. It was kind of a very naive uh, way of classifying organisms and life on earth before our modern time. Finally, he talks about uh, Darwin's uh, book. This is the whole title of it, by the way, many people just know it as the origin of species, but uh, it's a full title, by means of natural selection. So he's proposing the mechanism overall, not in detail, and or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Again, race is not what we understand today by race. Keep in mind that many words in our vocabulary are not univocal. Univocal means single meaning, right? Especially nouns. Vocal is voice, uh, is a word, and uni is single, right? That they have a single meaning. Oops. So many words are not univocal. And one of those is uh, Darwin's uh, where is use. Can you tell me if you can't read it, okay? If it's not large enough. Yeah, it's not what we understand today by race. In fact, race biologically has been discarded. It doesn't really have, it's a social construct when we talk about the different races, even though in government documents you still get race as a category but it doesn't fit anything biological that is there. Mm. Uh, for example, in forms, we Hispanics, sometimes we chuckle because we get a form to fill out and it will say uh, are you in the different categories, right? It will have, I don't know, African-American, uh, Oriental, uh, white or Hispanic. Well, you know, some people can actually classify for three of those. <laughs> uh, some of us are white and Hispanic, some of us are black and Hispanic. Uh, so the categories are really artificial. This race category is a social construct and it's, it's simplistic. It doesn't match really anything rigorous in nature. Ethnicity is a little better term because it's getting more at cultures, but even that ethnicity is is again culturally determined, right? It doesn't reflect anything strictly biological is what I'm trying to say. So, but yet he uses it in the title and what he's trying to say by race is, is uh, we could probably put here maybe species or at least group uh, phylum. It's anybody's guess, but uh, it was a term that he, that was, invoke, let's say, the term that was used at the time for talking about different groups of things. Even Darwin himself, when you read The Origin of Species, when you read this book, hmm, he, he doesn't necessarily use species a lot. He prefers to use variants. He talks about variants, uh, but he doesn't like the word species because it locks him in too much. And he's emphasizing diversity a lot. And therefore, variant is a better word to emphasize diversity, even within the species. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about variants uh, within a population, for example. Okay, and that's also why, in a sense, we needed a biological definition of species, because the term, even though it had been used already for centuries since Linnaeus as a classification, it was mostly on the appearance. And now, by doing the phylogenetics, by looking at uh, the genetic makeup and the actual uh, percentage homology, uh, taxonomists have to have, have to uh, reclassify species that look similar, but in fact were not as close as other species that didn't look as, as similar, but phylogenetically they're actually closer. 
when I, I'll give you specific examples when we get to it, to it. I don't want to get too much into detail of this first lecture, but we'll see examples as, as they come up. All right, so basically this is a functional definition for evolution, you know, it's change in the properties of populations. So here he has it at the level of population, not individual because individual variance within a population, but the population as, as a whole is, is changing, okay? Over time, which generally is a long period of time. So you can get to it. He also gets into energy and the entropy, which is an increase in disorder. Second law of thermodynamics, um, because these are things, is a flow of energy throughout the earth, which is what's keeping things alive, right? Because energy is needed for harnessing that light energy into chemical energy for photosynthesis, and then that begins the whole food chain. And then the follow, the um, the two branches, anagenesis and cladogenesis, again, technical terms that you can look at uh, toward the end of that uh, first chapter. So for now, basically read chapter one, try to dovetail it in with your summary of uh, this lecture one. And then uh, we go from there. You can, if you want, you're uh, free to use this as a background uh, scheme, if you will, for your own summary, right? But don't give me word by word because then it's no longer your summary, it's my summary. <laughs> yes. Yes, whatever. So you can use, for example, the outline that I sent you as the overall um, outline, and then fill in whatever applies to what I said in the lecture or and whatever you find relevant from a chapter one of Meyer. That's uh, how you put it together. So I expect a single summary from both uh, sources, the lecture and uh, chapter one. Mm -hmm. All right, so this uh, first summary may actually be a little longer than the others. Don't worry about, again, don't worry about the, the number of pages and all that. You know that I reformatted to crunch it down to, to a single sheet, but uh, you don't worry about the, the size for this first one, okay? Uh, is that it? Uh, all right, that's basically it. We're actually 10 minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> Rare, but true. Mm. And going forward, you can, um, depending on whatever time you have, uh, you can continue into uh, chapter two, then, yeah, chapter three, that would be part one. And we'll do the first five or six chapters of Meyer and then we'll stop there because it, it goes into too much detail or things that have been superseded. Okay, folks, well, this is all I have. Uh, you don't have any questions or comments. Uh, we're done for today and our next meeting, let's check the schedule. Did I give you actually the dates that I published that already on the... It's in the syllabus, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, because next Saturday, next Saturday I have um, prison ministry, so there's no meeting next Saturday. The next, our next uh, lecture will be on February 4, which is the first Saturday of February. Okay, first Saturday of February. So in two weeks, in two weeks, yeah, February 4. Okay, super. Let me stop the recording. Okay, we're ready to go. Thanks again. All the best. Bye for the virtual folks. <laughs>